Good morning. Oh, good evening. Thank you. I like to be corrected. That's cool. So a few thanks before we get started. I want to thank Natalie Durdak, our CBA communication manager, for her work on publicity and keeping track of our reservations for tonight. I want to thank Nancy Donovan, CBA special events coordinator, for organizing the event and to her students for taking care of logistics tonight. Yeah, very good. And I want to thank the RTAD Dryer Chair in Accounting and Ethics for funding this event. By the way, I'm Larry Calvers, the RTAD Dryer Chair in Accounting and Ethics. Thank you very much. So earnings uh, from the RTAD Dryer Chair in Accounting and Ethics Endowment funds my position on this speaker series. Uh, Chad and Jenny Dryer's generous contribution to fund the chair in accounting has provided LMU students uh, the opportunity for ethics education through the accounting and ethics course in the speaker series. In this role, I also make presentations to a number of professional groups uh, each year. Sadly, Chad Dreyer passed away just over a year ago, but his legacy lives on in this chair and many other positive impacts on LMU from his time and his treasure. I want to also thank the Institute for uh, business Ethics and Sustainability for its great programming this year, and this speaker series is now part of their programming. It's hard for me to believe I'm now in my 15th year as the Dryer Chair. The speaker series started in 2006 with Cynthia Cooper, who was a whistleblower in the WorldCom scandal, as our inaugural speaker. Since then, we have had a long list of exemplary speakers committed to the public's an investor's right to reliable financial and sustainability reporting. Tonight's speaker is no exception. Francine McKenna is a prolific writer and commentator on accounting, audit, and corporate governance issues affecting public and pre-IPO private companies. McKenna authors the newsletter, The Dig, where she scrutinizes and reports on these issues. I can go on and on, but as all you students know how to research more about her, how do you do that? Google her, right? And that will come up. So I'm very proud and pleased to have Francine McKenna with us tonight. Please give her a warm welcome. Wow. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. Um, fortunately, it's not Super Tuesday, or we'd be competing with that. I hear. Uh, Jamaica Kincaid, who's one of my favorite authors, is also here at Loyola. And uh, I only wish I could go see that speech, but I'm here with you guys instead. Um, thank you, Larry, and thank you, Nancy, for all of the logistics and the organizing. Um, I was here about a year and a half ago in the, in the fall and uh, fell in love with, with Loyola Marymount. Uh, it's just such an amazing place. It's a part of uh, a piece of Los Angeles that I'd like to come back to over and over. And so it's an honor to be here in this particular um, forum and for this particular purpose, and for Larry to have said, pick something spicy to talk about. And so I hope I'll be telling you something new. Um, those students who were uh, in the classes uh, earlier, uh, I promise you, mostly new. Um, and as always, I'm here for you, and there'll be lots of information about contacts and phone numbers and emails and Twitters and all this other stuff, um, because one of the reasons why I like to come out is to be able to develop those connections that last a lifetime and to repeat sort of some of the really great relationships that I made at KPMG, Bearing Point, and PwC, people that have stuck with me throughout my career and have offered that guidance and mentorship um, along the way. And so I want to be that for you and for the students that I come to visit. So as I said, this presentation is all mine, in particular now that um, I'm working back independently. And it's my way of giving back to the profession, having been part of uh, two different firms, um, being a CPA, uh, an accounting graduate. Um, it's my way of both staying in touch with the profession and also giving back. So here's the five myths. I should do some kind of fancy fade in or whatever, but I thought, hey, we're accountants. We need all the facts up front, right? And these are the five things. I had about 15 or 20 of them. And one thing I learned uh, as being a journalist is that 
if it's something that I think is important, um, but I'm having a hard time translating it to everybody else, or it might take too much explanation, cut it, edit. <laughs> so I stuck to five that I thought that you guys uh, might uh, appreciate or maybe have heard before. So the first one, which I think is important to constantly reiterate, constantly remember, keep in mind all the time is, um, the myth that audit professionals owe their duty to their firm, employer, and then to the client that pays the bill. Those of you who heard me talk earlier today heard that's not really the case. Second, the big four make sure auditors that bring shame on the profession by committing illegal acts are fired, not rewarded, and will never audit again. We would like to think that bad guys are taken out but unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case, at least not what I've seen. Third, auditors would never collude with clients because the profession, our profession, is built on our reputation and the importance of our reputation. I think we'll see that that's not also the case. Four, no one would pay for 100% absolute assurance, so reasonable assurance has to be good enough. How many of you have heard the term reasonable assurance? Okay, it's a cornerstone, okay? But the idea is, is that that's a bit of a crutch. And the excuse is that cost benefit, nobody would ever pay for absolute assurance. And finally, the number one classic big kahuna of myths, the audit is not designed to detect fraud. It is, and it should, and it does, and it has to. Okay, first, audit professionals owe a duty to their public accounting firm employer, then to the client who pays the bill. This is the classic employee-employee relationship, but we've actually signed up for something bigger. When you sign up for an accounting degree, when you sign up for the public accounting profession, when you sign up for the CPA exam, when you pass the test and become licensed, when you take continuing professional education every year, you've made a commitment to serve the public. And that's not just my Pollyannish kind of goody two-shoes view, okay, kind of from the journalism perspective, because I don't have to do it anymore. No, the Supreme Court said that. Back 30 years ago, in a case, Arthur Young and Company, uh, the US versus Arthur Young, okay, one of the predecessors to Ernst and Young, for those of you who don't go back that far, um, the Supreme Court said that auditors play a crucial role in the financial reporting process by serving as a public watchdog. If you work in the firms for very long, you'll learn that they also, or in journalism, you'll learn that the firms also don't really like to be called watchdogs because that implies a certain obligation and responsibility. That means you're actually on guard. And that means, too, that the relationship that you have with your clients is not a friendly go-along, get-along one, but is intended to be adversarial. And to be a public watchdog, means that you have to have total independence from the client at all times and complete fidelity to the public trust, meaning no cheating and worrying about the client first, no cheating and worrying about your partner first, no cheating and worrying about what the team thinks of you if you raise your hand and object to something wrong. To do that, you have to have appropriate professional skepticism. And like journalists, it was easy for me to transfer to this profession, to a, a second profession, because journalists also have to operate independently and objectively. We have to support our conclusions with evidence. And we have to sort of watch out for those red flags and raise our hand if we see sources or information that's inconsistent with the narrative or inconsistent, in particular, when we're covering um, politics or, or uh, 
public corporations, we have to look and we have to be willing to say, you know what, I'm not just going to be a stenographer. I'm actually going to dig in and ask questions and make sure that what you're saying is true. And that's very similar to how I was taught as an accountant and how we're expected to behave per the standards and per the, per the law as auditors. We're supposed to be raising our hand. We're supposed to be skeptical. We're not supposed to be friends with the client. So a skeptical eye and appropriate objectivity is essential. There's a related myth that I get a kick out of and I've written a lot about. And it's something that I think probably auditors as business people uh, in businesses, in big businesses, probably also here. It's kind of apropos today. I don't know if any of you heard um, uh, uh, Mr. Welch of GE passed away at age 84. He was the epitome of the maximized shareholder value crowd. That everything in a corporation is done in the service of maximizing shareholder value. And that's been sort of bastardized at this point into maximizing share price. And also, I've even heard minimizing taxes. Okay, So when we report on Amazon or some other companies that um, seem to constantly minimize their tax uh, obligations, we also hear, well, you know, it's a corporation's you know, responsibility to their shareholders to pay as little taxes as legally possible. Okay, So this is sort of the theory behind tax avoidance. And that's not true either. Okay, There is not something in corporate law that requires corporate directors and executives to maximize shareholder value. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. It's a myth developed by um, if you go into the details by the Chicago School of Economists, Milton Friedman and, and his followers, to make an excuse for the approach that ended up supporting um, share price as a way to pay higher executive compensation. But one of my heroes, since I've been writing in the last 15 years, someone that I became acquainted with, is Justice Leo Strine. And when I started writing um, 15 years ago, he was the, um, uh, a justice on the Chancery Court in Delaware, which is sort of in Delaware, sort of the business corporate uh, venue because a lot of companies have their corporate registrations in Delaware. And so the Delaware court um, gets involved in a lot, a lot of disputes, mergers and acquisitions and other kinds of corporate governance issues. So I was reading opinions by Judge Strine, and I got a chance to interview him and meet him a few times. And then he actually became um, a justice on the Delaware Supreme Court, so even more important. He's still a young guy. He just recently retired. And he's written many, many, many times. And I found out that he was actually a good friend of another professor who wrote often on this subject, Lynn Stout, who passed away, uh, sadly, a few years ago. She was a very, very, very strong activist on this idea that you know, the, there is no legal obligation for executives and directors to maximize shareholder value, to maximize share price. It doesn't exist in the law. It's a, it's a custom and a myth. And Judge Strine wrote back in 2012 um, sort of what I repeat to other journalists and everybody else, sort of the definitive sort of response to this, retort to this, and that is, he says, he does not mean to imply that the corporate law requires directors to maximize short-term profits for shareholders. So he had a long discussion before, but he wanted to make sure everybody understood he wasn't saying that in the law was a requirement for directors to maximize short-term profits for shareholders. Rather, what I'm telling you is that corporate law requires directors as a matter of their duty of loyalty to pursue a good faith strategy to maximize profits for shareholders, which is a little bit more subtle. But what he was also saying is that as a result, you have sort of this dilemma of corporations trying to do this anyway and executives trying to do this anyway. For-profit corporations have incentives towards profit maximization. 
And so they are not the ones that should be in the position to evaluate risk or to be their own regulators. Sound familiar? What is he really saying? He's saying what Martin Luther King said. Morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Judicial decrees may not change hearts, but they can restrain the heartless. I have this tattooed on my, I'm only kidding. Myth number two. The big four firms make sure auditors that bring shame on the profession by committing illegal and unethical acts are fired, not rewarded, and will never audit again. If only, if only. Most of you are familiar, hopefully, with the recent scandal of KPMG and PCOB, the regulator, um, where KPMG executives um, hired PCOB executives and then had them bringing over uh, confidential regulatory information about what um, engagements were going to be inspected. For three years, they were getting these lists. They were also getting additional information about the other firms and their inspections, which they used in a competitive environment to win bids to beat out other firms for audits. Um, they also got information about how the models were built at the PCAOB so that they could hire a, a consultant, Palantir, who also works like with the NSA and law enforcement, to build models not to create um, a really good tool for the firm to improve quality and learn from the previous inspections about what they might have done wrong and build better training and try to help you know, uh, in, uh, get better at how they were doing audits. No, the purpose of getting all this information and building the models was to predict which audits were going to be inspected. It's stated, it's stated in all of the legal complaints, okay? It was a complete, I want to gain the system, I want to figure out um, how I'm gonna be scored so that I can get the highest possible score and basically get these regulators off my back. KPMG was lagging in terms of its performance on the inspections. Um, the other firms had sort of solved whatever problems they had in performing better on the inspections, and KPMG was sort of lagging, and they were sort of the last firm to hire people from the PCAOB to help them. They were sort of the last firm to try to figure out how to you know, overcome this problem, and they overcame the problem by basically stealing the exam. What's happened? Well, these partners who were indicted, okay, three legacy partners, and two people that became uh, uh, partners, executives in KPMG who had come from the PCOB. Um, KPMG made an announcement that they had left the firm once they found out that this had occurred. How did they find out that this had occurred? One partner in the third year raised her hand and became a whistleblower, Diana Koontz, a financial services partner in Chicago. Nobody else and I will tell you that we've gone through the transcripts. I'm working with some academics on some research. We've gone through the transcripts. There's more than 120 partners in KPMG over those three years that are mentioned in the trial transcripts, let alone that maybe we're also involved or aware of this going on for three years. Not one of them ever raised their hand or complained about it or talked to legal or uh, phoned to the hotline. Everybody took the information, everybody let these uh, teams go in and intervene and fix stuff in their engagements and on their work papers so that they could perform better in the inspections. And they did. They almost immediately turned it around and started performing better. And nobody questioned how did they get this dramatic result until the third year when the, partner, or the guy who came over from the PCOB and became a partner actually got complacent and actually told her, you're on the list. And she said, what? And he said, you're on the list, and we're going to have to come in and you know, take a look at your, your, your audits, and we're going to fix some stuff and make sure that you pass the, you know, the inspection in a 
in a better shape. Why? I'm on the li what are you talking about? And she immediately reported it to her superior and to the national office. And, it, and because they were sort of like completely shocked, it ended up going up to legal counsel. And then KPMG could not, the leadership could not sort of deny that there was something going on. And they immediately then reported it to the SEC and to the PCAOB. And they announced that these partners were leaving the firm. But the end result was that even though they were indicted, even though one of them was tried and found guilty and sentenced to prison, two of them pleaded guilty and will receive sentences, those three legacy partners were allowed to retire with full benefits. There are two other partners recently that were involved in some issues um, at PwC. One with um, Mattel and one with an enforcement action against PwC for several independence violations. One partner was responsible for, over just a few years recently, 15 engagements, 19 instances of selling non-audit services, systems development and implementation services to audit clients. Clearly forbidden by Sarbanes-Oxley. Been forbidden for the last 18 years. And yet, this one person did it 19 times in 15 engagements. And again, how do they find out, how did this happen? Um, it's not really clear from the, from the enforcement action, but I think one of the clients kind of let it out of the bag. One of the clients actually fired PwC as the auditor because they found that there was this independence violation. That person who was charged by the, P, by the, by the SEC the SEC charged PwC, they paid an $8 million fine, he paid a small fine. When this whole thing was announced in the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal said he's gonna remain with the firm. The initial word that they got from PwC was that he would be just put on administrative leave. Later, he kind of quietly left the firm because more people wrote about it and people were just appalled. So it wasn't what actually happened, which had been going on for a while and which PwC knew was going on and had been negotiating with the SEC to resolve for a while. It wasn't all of that knowledge which made this person leave the firm or PwC ask him to leave the firm, but the publicity. The I'm on the cover of the Wall Street Journal for the wrong reasons effect. And it's not clear whether he or this other partner involved in this Mattel issue were terminated for cause or whether they were allowed to retire. Again, these are pieces of information that we don't get, that they don't readily tell you, but they quietly leave the firm. Um, Mattel was a situation where Mattel itself disclosed that they were gonna do a restatement, that they had actually uh, had issues with PwC and with the engagement team on, from an independence perspective. The partner was helping Mattel hire finance and accounting executives, the people that would be in responsibility of overseeing the partner on the engagement. And he was recommending people to the company. Um, again, this was publicized. The story hit, and then another story hit the Wall Street Journal that um, there was a whistleblower. In addition to the whistleblower that actually brought the initial problem to the attention of Mattel and, and reported this independence violation and reported the issues with, that, re, that resulted in the restatement. And the story in the Wall Street Journal was from another person who had been the tax director and he said, it's worse than that. They realized they made a mistake in this particular entry related to deferred taxes. 
And PwC and Mattel got together and tried to figure out how to avoid booking a restatement, booking the hit. And he, the story talks about, you know, when they figured something out, they had high fives, et cetera, and then the whistleblower blew the whistle and they ended up having to restate anyway. And again, the partner who was removed from the engagement and the rest of his team, because he was involved in these independence violations, ones that the client reported to the SEC, that partner was still at the firm. But when the story hit the, uh, the Wall Street Journal of this additional person talking about that the firm was complicit, that this was sort of a high five kind of thing, um, then again, that partner quietly left the firm. Were they allowed to retire so they could remain friends of the firm and not potential adversaries in litigation? There's now litigation against PwC for Mattel. There's a class action lawsuit that's developing and it hasn't been certified yet, but there's several uh, firms that are preparing litigation against PwC. Um, and you know, there's always the possibility that the SEC or the PCOB will bring some kind of charges against them. Um, and so the firms usually like to keep people that are involved in these kinds of situations on because uh, if you're a partner and they fire you, then you could actually end up testifying against the firm, either a plaintiff's attorney or the government attorneys could get you to end up turning and providing evidence against the firm. So they usually keep them on in some kind of administrative thing until all of the all of the litigation is resolved. But these two, because of the publicity, are not with the firm anymore. But my suspicion is that they were probably allowed to retire so that um, they were still beholden to the firm. If you retire from the firm, then obviously they have those golden handcuffs based on the fact that they're giving you your retirement benefits. And they have to approve any kind of uh, uh, work that you might do where you're earning money. You can't do anything for money once you retire from the firms unless the firm gives you permission. You can't be on a board, you can't do consulting, you can't do any kind of expert witness, you can't do anything unless they give you permission. So what have the P SEC and PCOB decided to do in the face of all these years long willful defiance of Sarbanes-Oxley's auditor independence laws, ones that prohibit uh, firms from designing and developing software, from uh, being participating in hiring the, the client's own accounting and finance personnel. What have they decided to do? Well, one, they haven't brought any actions against these partners or the firms related to these instances. But worse, the SEC and the PCAOB are now proposing to relax several auditor independence rules because in my opinion, they've been unwilling and unable to monitor and enforce the firms and the partners to comply with them. I did a short article for my newsletter about these issues and Barbara Roper, who's um, a part of the Consumer Federation, which is a very strong investment um, investor, retail investor uh, advocate, told me that enforcement of the auditor independence rules so most of us are familiar, if you have not been in the profession for 40 years, if you're mostly familiar with the auditor independence rules that came in during SOX in 2002, the pro prohibitions against the auditor performing certain services for the audit clients. But there's many, many independence rules that have been around forever. Things about um, financial uh, uh, relationships with your audit clients, things about you know hiring and going to work for your audit clients, very basic stuff. Things about you know if you audit a bank, you can't you know have a bus a banking relationship with that bank. Lots of you know mortgages and lots of different things like that. They've been around forever. So this is there's a lot of stuff that's not new. But in particular, Barbara says that the enforcement of the auditor independence rules, including the ones since Sachs, has been inconsistent and weak, in particular, since 2002. But why? And that's because the fundamental biggest fear of the regulators right now in doing anything about what they may or may not see going on at the firms 
is that they can't run, they don't want to run the risk of putting another big firm out of business like Arthur Anderson. They're unwilling to hold the firms fully accountable for repeatedly defying the law and compromising the integrity of audits, Chairman Clayton and his predecessors. So it's not just a Trump administration, it's, it's, it goes beyond, okay? It's a general willingness to allow the firms to operate with impunity because of this fear of putting, the firm, putting another firm out of business. They're not just too big to fail, but there are really too few now to call to account. So again, I have to correct journalists a lot because they want to put the too, few, too big to fail thing on the firms because the big four are big and global, et cetera. Well, to do the work the way, they're, the way audits are designed, they have to be big. They have to have an enormous number of people with lots of expertise over wide geographic ranges. They have to be big. That's the design and the nature of the work that gets done. But the problem is, is right now there are too few, such that there's a lot of uh, uh, concern that if one was somehow forced out of business, the remaining three would not be able to absorb the people and the clients, in particular because the one that would be forced out probably would be saddled with not only the litigation that sort of was the last straw, but a whole bunch of other stuff that sort of brought it to that brink. And you know, the Sprinkle and Abraham's cases are not the only ones like this where you know, people have operated with impunity even though they've done really bad things. There's a case of a guy named Adrian Beamish um, who is suspended and he's still working at the firm. I actually just checked uh, on Sunday um, Make sure on LinkedIn he was still there. He's still there. And he's suspended. He's basically professionally impotent. He cannot sign an audit. And if I call the firm as a journalist and say, well, what is he doing? Um, they won't tell me. He's probably in some marketing or administrative, but God forbid they don't put him in national office. Not that that's not been done before. The first big fine against a firm by the PCOB was against Deloitte, and it was because they had a guy, um, Christopher Anderson, who was involved in the audit of Navistar way back in the day. And I have a personal experience with that. I was involved in some consulting with that very early on in 2006 and 2007. And Christopher Anderson, was part of this whole issue of uh, numerous, multiple restatements at Navistar. And he was uh, uh, banned. And while he was banned, they put him in the national office and he was consulting on other audits. And they didn't find out you know, right away, but it just was happenstance that during one of the inspections, somebody saw the name and it's sort of a common name, so it's amazing that someone in PCOB recognized the name. But one of the good things was there were a lot of people at PCOB that were there from the beginning and stayed for a long time until recently. And so you have the sort of context and cognizance of, oh my gosh, that name sounds familiar. Christopher Ainge said, why are we talking to that? Is he signed the consulting for that? What? He's the guy that, that got banned from Navistar. And they caught him and they fined Deloitte $2 million. This was one of the biggest fines against a firm. There's another guy, Nick DeFazio, uh, involved in the Delphi audit failure. And again, another big one back in the day. And DeFazio ended up actually staying on and they actually flipped him. The SEC flipped him. They really got him in a corner and they actually got him to say stuff against the firm. And yet, he's still at the firm to this day. And he's still running the IFRS consulting business. Number three, audit 
auditors will never collude with clients or commit other illegal acts because the profession's viability relies on its reputation for honesty and integrity, right? We're like better than everybody else, right? We're accountants, okay? We're purer and holier. In fact, I joke around and say, you know, where did this myth ever come from? We are not capitalist eunuchs. We are human beings who are uh, tempted by the same incentives as everybody else. And the expectation that we would not be has allowed, I think, a lot of sort of, you know, leeway and benefit of the doubt to be given and obviously for a lot of people to take advantage of that trust. Um, my first job out of college was at Continental Bank. And I don't think there's anyone in this room, maybe one or two of you, who would remember Continental Bank as the first too big to fail bank. It was a bank that made some really bad uh, loans and syndicated them to this little bank called Penn Square in Oklahoma and crowded that bank with a whole bunch of toxic loans. And when that bank went bust, uh, it put Continental Bank in jeopardy. They were being over aggressive and, and not prudently lending and syndicating that risk out, and then it came back to haunt them. And <laughs> there were a lot of lawsuits related to that. And one of them, <coughs> a judge actually put into words what I'm saying, like expressed this idea that gave a lot of audit auditors for a lot of years the confidence that they would get this kind of pass from judges going forward, and that is, he believed and had been told and had been sort of trained probably by the auditor, audit firm defense lawyers over the years, that an audit firm and its partners will above all think about the firms and their own reputations first. That whole, you know, you hear about the Wall Street Journal effect, you know, don't do anything you don't want to see in the Wall, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And that was to the max in terms of when you grew up, you know, in accounting programs and in, on audit, in the audit firms. You know, the idea was is that we are all so much better, we would never do anything that would bring shame on the profession. Because people trust us to do this work, they trust us, and our opinion has to mean something, has to mean that we have uh, lived up to that trust and acted with integrity. An accountant's greatest asset is its reputation for honesty, followed closely by its reputation for careful work. These, for two years, audits could never approach the losses Ernst and, um, Ernst and Young would suffer from a perception that it would muffle a client's fraud, that it would not speak up, that it would suppress that information. Well, those times have changed. The amount of fees that the firms can make between audits and consulting and tax, et cetera, et cetera, compared to the fines that they might get or the settlements that they may have to pay much, 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 much later in a lawsuit, the fees far outweigh the cost of litigation, far outweigh. And so it's a cost of doing business in many cases. They understand that some of them are going to get picked up, and there's going to be some fines every once in a while, and there's going to be some lawsuits once in a while, which is why most of the lawsuits settle, because it's just considered a cost of doing business. It's not about finding the truth and figuring out whether or not we did something wrong and correcting it so that we never do it again, and we're so embarrassed and so shamed by this whole thing. A while ago, I wrote for the Chicago Booth Review. Chicago, the Booth School of Business and University of Chicago has a magazine that highlights uh, uh, academic research. And there was a, a group of academics that had a paper about how um, one of the firms got in trouble in Tokyo and they would, you know, they absolutely would not have, you know, colluded with the client because, you know, the auditors have reputational incentives to avoid audit failures. This is uh, still in 2013, some academics were repeating this myth. 
because audit quality is valuable to clients and so priced in the market for audit services. Clients defect to other auditors when an audit firm's reputation de deteriorates. And I said in the article, which made me very popular with these academics, do they really, really, really? Even the authors of the paper admitted that prior literature finds kind of mixed support at best for the importance of auditor reputation as a driver of audit quality. There have been several cases of things like insider trading that you would think would have brought enormous shame on the firms. For you to question what in the world? You had a partner here in Southern California from KPMG, Scott London, who was the regional managing partner. He was responsible for hundreds of people for many, many, many large audits, in particular, uh, Herbalife, Skechers, and another small company which ended up in the, in the complaint. And he pled guilty to using confidential information to his access to those audits because he was the partner in charge so he could go to any audit committee meeting of any of the clients in that region. He was sentenced to 14 months in prison. And yet, KPMG still audits Citigroup. They still audit Wells Fargo. They still audit the Port Puerto Rico. They didn't lose any clients. There was, uh, you know, the clients that were highlighted in the newspaper that he had actually traded uh, or given information to his friend um, in exchange for a paper bag full of money in the Starbucks parking lot. Uh, those clients actually were forced to um, change auditors. So Herbalife changed from KPMG to PwC. Um, Skechers, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember now. But Skechers had actually let Scott London be the lead engagement partner, roll off after the five years and then roll back on when his time was up. They liked Scott London so much and they did, had no idea that he was sharing their information with his friend. These kinds of situations should have provided an example to others that not only was such behavior illegal and unethical, but that people would be caught. Instead, we have cases of non-partners and one partner, KPMG, that also recently insider traded. And there's lots of examples that, despite scandals and frauds that should have severely dented the auditor's reputation in the public eye, there was little impact on the firms from a business perspective. When KPMG uh, was almost indicted for tax fraud in 2005, but not indicted because again, they realized that would have turned into another Arthur Anderson, they were not debarred. Okay, debarred means forbidden from um, uh, engaging in any federal contracts. You've done something really wrong. You've committed fraud. You've had some kind of illegal activity. And therefore, we don't want that vendor working with a federal contract. They were not debarred. Why? Because the federal government depends heavily on KPMG. They were auditing the US Treasury. They were auditing the Department of Justice. They were auditing, auditing the IRS. Even when uh, we had the financial crisis, and Citigroup had to be bailed out and substantially owned by the federal government. They never fired KPMG. They kept them on, even after the Citigroup went back into private ownership. AIG executives ended up having to be bailed out and substantially owned by the government. PwC is still the auditor since 1982 of AIG. The US Treasury and the New York Federal Reserve hired Ernst & Young to help manage the TARP program, despite Ernst & Young's involvement with Lehman Brothers and bankruptcy examiner report that said Ernst & Young was part of the problem, not the solution in what happened at Lehman Brothers. The federal government never debarred Deloitte, even though Deloitte has had several problems with both um, 
the New York Department of Financial Services, the issues that I described before in terms of you know, bringing back a partner into a national office, other kinds of issues with other clients. Um, and KPMG actually recently replaced Deloitte as the auditor of the Federal Reserve Bank. So there is no sort of pun punishment penalty to the firms when they have these reputational issues, no matter how bad it is, because not only are many, many, many public companies dependent on the big four, almost 100% here in the US in terms of the S&P 500, but many, many, many agencies in the federal government, state governments are heavily dependent on the big four. I'm going the wrong way. So, I wrote this in 2014. I believe it is sort of more true today than it even was six years ago. Is it irrational to believe that auditors are capable of acting capriciously in a self-interested manner, and perhaps like any other human being against the law? Are auditors the only market eunuchs in our capitalist system immune from the influence of financial incentives? That is sort of the attitude that judges and courts and even journalists have had about the firms in excusing some of these things and in the federal government to allow the firms to be involved in trusted positions, in particular during the crisis. I think that we have to have a more realistic attitude about the firms. Myth number four, no one would pay 100% for absolute assurance, so reasonable assurance has to be good enough. So there's a long sort of history about this sort of cost-benefit rationale to why we don't have 100% um, sampling. In the past, when we didn't have the sort of technological capabilities that we have now, it may have been reasonable to make that assumption. Um, there was an article way back in March 2007. This is after several other scandals. PwC's US chairman at the time, Dennis Nally, was asked by one of the reporters in the Wall Street Journal, you know, where were the auditors with all these companies that were now under scrutiny for backdated stock options? That's a whole different scandal that we, it would take us hours to describe what happened there. But an academic found that this was happening. And many, many companies and some auditors actually were nabbed for sort of doing this, backdating these stock options. And Nally says, if the public has a view that the auditor's report on a set of financial statements is designed to provide absolute assurance, that is not what the auditing profession is all about. We're providing reasonable assurance. There's a big difference between absolute and reasonable. Yes, the cost of liability. But auditing standard number 10 says the auditor has a responsibility to plan and perform an audit to obtain reasonable assurance. Despite the fact that nowadays, we've got to push towards technology that further automates the analysis of data to reduce costs and to keep up with the automated nature of clients' um, systems and the way they do things, and the increasing volume of data that's running through those systems. We have a dilemma now because auditors would like to continue to rely on this expectation of reasonable assurance is all they can do, but the technology says it may be possible to do more. And in fact, some people are doing it. In 2016, uh, Michael Rappaport at the Wall Street Journal sort of did an update on how is technology impacting the firms. And the language was sort of scary, it should have been scary if you were a firm, because it's talking about more accurate, more comprehensive, giving investors greater assurance now that we have all these tools. The tools can examine all of the client's transactions instead of just a sample. Hello? Not only can computers review all the clients instead of a portion, they can see patterns. What does that talk, what is that, what is that? tell you, okay? You might actually be able to see anomalies and fraud. Some say that new tools may have helped stop frauds like those at Enron. And there was a guy from PwC who actually admitted that. 
If these tools had been around 15 years ago, could some of those things have been prevented? You bet. Just the other day uh, at the Journal of Accountancy, um, you have uh, some, a partner from Deloitte saying, doing 100% populations is the next big thing. As a partner, I get a lot of comfort out of looking at 100%. Oh, are you ready to be on the hook for 100%? Artificial intelligence, data analytics, other automation tools that increase the size and speed of data analysis to approach 100% will invalidate the, their only samples, excuse for not detecting fraud, and therefore put auditors on the hook when it's missed. Lest anyone think that this automation will virtually eliminate most of the human hours and the humans that audit firms charge clients for, some are still optimistic. Two Deloitte professionals in CFO magazine in 2015 said, and they, they're, they're talking about this directly, this is real, okay? People are worried that automation is going to eliminate sort of the whole bottom layer of the firms. And they're saying, however, you know, this can liberate the auditor's time to focus on more risk areas and on less rote tasks. It also enhances the auditor's professional judgment. We're confident that the future cognitively transformed audit processes will enhance the skills and satisfaction. You're going to be more satisfied. More satisfied. Although new skills will be required, that's why you're hearing so much about upskilling, we see plenty of demand for well-trained auditors for years to come. Okay, so don't worry about it. But I was part of another big automation push back in 1998, 2001, when I worked for KPMG Consulting and Bearing Point. We sold that same kind of optimism to people who were buying new ERP systems, the new WhizBang ERP software. And we were actually implementing new systems in state and local governments. And I was working in Latin America with a lot of companies that were big, giant conglomerates. And they had tons and tons of people working for them. And we would say, you're going to get to do higher level work. You're not going to have to do all that routine work anymore. In those cases, upskilling either never came or didn't stick. Unions, in some cases, preserve people's jobs, despite the automation push. I predict the audit firms will never go to 100% sampling, because neither their leadership nor their clients really want it. And despite the promise and the hope of cost savings, both sides want wiggle room. So reasonable assurance allows the firms and the clients to have an element of judgment and discretion in the information that they produce. 100% sampling says, it is what it is. There's no denying. The clients are going to squeeze the audit firms to reduce fees no matter what, or at least not increase it that much. But auditors will always try to bill more. They'll find a way. And given that the audit product is about people, it's about hours. The product is people hours. Okay, That means I think people will always be part of the process. Finally. The audit is not designed to detect fraud. How many of you have ever heard that? The audit is not designed to detect fraud. Okay, But the auditors used to actually acknowledge that it was their responsibility to detect fraud. Back in 2007, the Wall Street Journal asked Dennis Nally, is it an auditor's job to try and find fraud? No more simply than that. And he said, absolutely. And the Wall Street Journal said, you seem pretty certain, but the firms often like deny this, especially in court. No, we've always had that responsibility. But there is sort of an expectation gap because of reasonable assurance, which is driven by cost benefit. But that all changed when PwC got hit by Satyam, which was a big scandal in India. And Instead, they started changing their tune and started talking about being duped. Our partners were misled. This was a massive fraud. We are victims, too. And going back to this idea of the expectation gap, to talk about the fact that 
hey, you know, we're never going to catch everything, in particular when there's a collusive fraud. So when management executives are on purpose trying to deceive everyone, hey, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, stuff happens. And they kept saying that. They doubled down on that. They asked uh, um, Nally when he became chairman and, you know, about something that the former chairman, Sam Di Piazza, had said. Is PwC really a victim? Do you really mean that, that, he, that PwC was a victim of Satyam and of these executives? No, 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 no. I mean, like, that the auditor was duped in the process. Duped. So when you say that the auditors and the audit firms were duped, that's why a fraud occurred. We've been duped. What does that really say about what you're saying about the professionalism and the competence of the firm and of its professionals? If you have two choices, I'm complicit or I'm too stupid, they're picking too stupid. It's an insult. Instead of acknowledging where people have actually broken the vow and taking responsibility and calling those people to account and getting them out. And this was repeated by several other executives. Bill Parrott, who retired in 2010 from Deloitte, went to work immediately for a private equity firm where Deloitte was the auditor, saying the same thing. There's an expectations gap. That's the other sort of phrase that's used, the expectation gap. Investors expect us to find fraud, but we're never going to do it because of reasonable assurance. Again, the Financial Times asked again. And there, are many, there had been many, many, many other scandals during this period, and they're still saying the same thing. But the answer is really yes. The audit is designed to detect fraud. And we found that out in the most recent case where PwC was sued by the FDIC for this big bank failure, Colonial Bank. After a trial in front of a judge, after a verdict of guilty, after a damages claim, the judge said, there can be no dispute, and PwC doesn't have any ability to even raise one. They have no defense. It was foreseeable that because PwC failed to detect the fraud, Colonial would continue to fund these mortgages, both legitimate ones and fake ones. PwC had a duty to exercise reasonable care, to perform its audit according to the standards, and if they would have, they would have found the fraud. It was the largest ever damages award for law auditor liability. $625 million ever. They ended up negotiating and settling it for $335 million, which is actually still big. And the PCOB has published an appendix that actually lays this out from beginning to end, from client acceptance and continuance, all the way to if you're on an audit and the client is clearly committing some kind of illegal act or fraud and they won't do anything about it, the audit firm has a responsibility to report that to the SEC. So from beginning to end of the relationship and all the way in between, at every step of the process in terms of how you design and perform the audit, you have to have fraud in the back of your mind. And they produced this appendix and it should have been the end of the line, it should have been the last word. And many had said it before. There's a guy, Dan Guy, who was a, a veteran um, professional with the AICPA, et cetera, who now does a lot of expert witness work. And he said it back in 2008. Okay, auditors still disavow this responsibility. Unfortunately, they're frequently saying this in court and getting their experts to say it. Of course, it contradicts the standards and if it were true that audit, the audit was not designed to detect fraud, audits performed by CPAs would be worthless. Think, think about that. If we keep insisting as a profession that the audit is not designed to detect fraud, 
and that we're allowed to be able to operate with impunity because we're too big to fail, we're going to end up, we've already ended up, in a position where significant investors do not think an audit is worth it. How many of you have heard about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes? Okay, what you didn't hear, uh, what maybe John Kerry will talk about when he comes here on March 17th, I highly recommend going to listen to John Kerry, the author of Bad Blood, who's going to be here. I just saw that on a poster. Really good guy, really good reporter, really good book. But he didn't talk about the accounting and the financial fraud. He talked about the medical safety fraud. What he didn't mention in his book, what he didn't mention in his reporting is that the Ranos never had an accountant on duty at any time during its history. They never hired an outside accounting firm to help them produce financial statements, and their investors did not insist on audited financial statements before they invested hundreds of millions of dollars. The kicker is, is that these folks who invested hundreds of millions of dollars were top names. Rupert Murdoch, who runs News Corp, Larry Ellison, who runs Oracle, um, the Walton family, the DeVos family, who, who's uh, involved in Amway, many other investors who are very, very knowledgeable about the purpose of an audit, what is the role and responsibility of accountants, why we produce audited financial statements, why it's in the law that you have to have audited financial statements in order to file your financial information with the SEC if you want to be a listed company. They know very well what the firms do and why they pay them in the companies that they run that are public companies. But when they invested their own money in Theranos, they did not value an audit. They did not insist that the information that they were given was audited. They invested their money with no due diligence about whether the financial information that they were getting was true, and they found out later that they were just making it all up. The future is already here. Significant institutional investors and many others think of audit and accounting as a necessary evil and occasionally an obstacle or a pain in the neck that stands in the way of an investment doing well, of a company doing well, of a company being able to IPO, of a company being able to continue to increase its stock price. And so as a profession, as professionals, we have to start rethinking our role and our value because otherwise there's going to be a lot more Theranos and a lot more investors who are going to find ways, including talking the SEC into reducing the role of audits and auditors and the work that auditors do, like uh, ICFR and 404B opinions, internal control opinions, et cetera, saying it costs too much, it's not worth it, it doesn't add anything, it doesn't add quality, it doesn't prevent fraud. That's the bottom line. It does not detect or prevent fraud. Frauds happen despite all this money we're spending with audit firms. And if we can't find a way to either fess up, stand up, step up, we're going to be opted out. There's a really good thing here. If you get this online uh, later when it's posted, Dan Guy has a really, really good list from 2008 about why the, what are the most common reasons why auditors fail to detect fraud? And the number one is fail, failure to have professional skepticism and failure to maintain independence. In other words, you get too close, you get in bed, you get too compromised with the client, you forget your public duty, you forget your responsibility, you forget why you're there, and therefore the clients start wondering, the investors start wondering, why are you there? Why am I paying you? Why am I doing this? For now, it's just a mandated legal requirement. And given the anti-regulatory environment that we're in, it would not be surprising. It's already been vocalized by some SEC commissioners like Hester Peirce. You know, if it were up to me if I'm queen for the day, I would not have anybody have to pay for an audit. That's an SEC commissioner. That's how precarious we are. That's how important it is that when you go to work, 
You take your job seriously. You consider it a vocation. You do the right thing because investors and the capital markets are counting on you and the firms have allowed that to slip away. And that is going to potentially make the whole thing slip away if it goes too far. I mentioned this to some of the students that were in the classes. When you get out on the job, how do you maintain this professionalism and professional skepticism? And the number one rule is don't be a pleaser. Be tough. Be strong. Raise your hand. Take the consequences. Set up a plan B and a plan C so that you can do that. Find your phone a friend. Find your sponsors. Find your support. Find your mentors that you can go to for good feedback about what's going on and do the right thing. Otherwise, I'm going to see your name in an SEC enforcement action for all the wrong reasons. Instead of seeing you become partners someday and make me proud. Lots of good books for you to read. I highly recommend them. And finally, call, write. I'm always, always, always willing to answer questions to help you sort something out or to provide uh, resources, ideas, suggestions, and plan Bs and plan Cs and plan Ds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Francine. We have time for maybe one question, and then we can have some more discussion out in the hall. We have food, right? Food uh, out in the hall. Anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? Everybody wants food. Everybody's yes. Um, in a perfect world, would you be for the implementation of the computer-generated system or stick with completely traditional? Oh, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We should always move forward. We should always progress. What I'm saying is, is be realistic because all new things take time. They're not going to get absorbed overnight. They're going to be good for you because you're going to learn new schools. You're going to learn new things. And the firms are going to have to, the leadership is going to have to reconcile this idea of, but what does that mean? What does that mean if we're actually producing 100% samples? What is then the obligation and the liability that we're willing to accept? But you, in the meantime, you enjoy the opportunities that working for the largest firms present, which is an enormous amount of training, enormous amount of really great people to work for. I work for lots of really smart people that I learn from, and thank God that are still there for me to answer questions. So take advantage of all of it. We should move forward. We should always automate and, and move forward technologically. You have to to keep up with your clients. You'd be really, really worthless if the clients are moving forward and automating and using all kinds of sophisticated system, and we're not keeping up. Thank you for Thank the question. You. And one more round of applause, Francine. We Thank you again for spending the day with us and the night with us. And we have some swag, some LMU swag to go with you.